It's Wombat Jones for Ramen Chokehold here with one of the most well-respected lightweights going around in Australia who's been on the scene for a very long time. I'm here with Greg the Tarantula at Zuri. How are you going, mate? Yeah, good, man. Yeah, really good. Excited to be on the show. Thanks so much for coming on and spending time. I know you guys, it's only a week away from the fight. So thanks for taking a little bit of time out to talk to us here, mate. And we'll get everyone excited about the fight. But uh, before we even get into the fight, mate, you're up there in God's country. I've got to tell you a little story. My nan and pop back in 1980, probably five, uh, used to run the caravan park there. So from Sydney, we used to drive up and then stay in the caravan park. Is that place still there or what? In Harvey Bay. In Harvey Bay. There's probably about 10 caravan parks, man. There's a fair few. Yeah, right. So what's it like these days? Is it like just a big tourist sort of an area or? Oh, it, it isn't. It, it's, it's like a little city, but in, in saying that, man, it, it's, it's, it's big, but it's not. It's kind of weird. And it's spread out a fair bit. Like the furthest part of town will probably be half an hour out, but sometimes you'll drive like 15 minutes without even seeing anything but like a cow. So <laughs> it's still it's still pretty spread out. Um, it's pretty central in one layer. And like where you're probably talking about on the Esnard, there's about four caravan parks. Yeah, it was on the yeah. right, going down a hill on the right-hand side just before you went under that bridge thing that had all the shops on the right. That probably has probably changed totally, mate. I haven't been there in 20, 25 years. <laughs> yeah. when, what year was that? Uh, uh, like mid-80s. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was still living in New South Wales there myself. I was born in Wollongong, so. Oh, you're a gong boy. There you go. Yeah. So you choke on the stuff we learn, everybody. But, <laughs> mate, here's a oh, – I want to play a little game with you now. You oh, yeah. have fought on a lot of promotions, and I mean a lot of promotions. I want to see if you can name every promotion you fought under as a pro. As a pro. As a pro. So that's, a, that's a hard question because when I first fought, there wasn't this pro and amateur thing. It was pretty much you got a phone call. And I had a manager at the time. He's like, oh, they want you to fight. They're going to give you this much money. Go fight. And it's just whatever rules. So I'm like, oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw some shorts in if um, the guy doesn't make weight. Like that's how much it was. And um, they didn't say we're the pro or amateur. So I think my that was considered amateur now, which is um, tap out underground. And actually before that, I fought on a show, which doesn't show on most of my records. It's actually a Gold Coast PCYC against Ben Mortimer at the time. And that was pretty much, I took the fight and um, he broke my nose, broke my foot and I lost. And I, I think if I didn't have won, I lost that fight, I wouldn't have kept going, but it, it annoyed me something about it and I kept back. Um, so the Gold Coast PCYC, under, uh, tap out underground, Fight World Cup, uh, CFC, um, uh, Eternal, um, oh, we're now we're getting out of order, but we'll let you get away with it. Oh, so I got to go in order. <laughs> no, 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 it's uh, fine. No, no. So you go, um, you're going good. Uh, Chaos Entertainment over in Perth. Um, Brace. Um, oh, who else? Uh, oh, there's there's a CFC started a second show in Sydney. It's called Super Something. Um, I can't. I fought Able Brights on that. I can't remember what the show was called. Yeah, Do Super you know Fight it? Series. Super yeah. Fight Series. Yeah. Um, obviously Hex. Uh, and soon to be Diamondback. Um, I'm pretty sure that's it. Is Max, that it? Maximum Impact. Oh, Maximum Impact in Adelaide. Yes. Southern Fight Promotions. Okay. Okay. And, remember that and one. Rochambeau. Don't forget Rochambeau. Oh yes, Rochambeau. We're gonna fight Alex Velasquez. Yes. And Nitro. <laughs> Oh, Nitro. Oh, yes. Wow, okay. Yeah, so, so I forgot a few. <laughs> you forgot a few, but, mate, like you said, you're adding Diamondback now to that list. And and what do you know about Diamondback? I've obviously, I'm coming down for the fights. So I'm, I'm absolutely pumped for it. Um, I've done my research on these guys, and they look the absolute goods. What do you know about them, and what's your experience been, you know, with them so far? Well, um, Craig, the the promoter, he's he's been – talking to me on Facebook after uh, probably my last three fights and just saying he'd love to get me down here again someday. So he, apparently, he's been following me from there and we've been trying to get it onto the right – the the timing, I've been locked in with other fight promotions. I'm I'm pretty loyal. If a, if a promoter rings me and says, I want you to fight here, can you not fight? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for you because I understand when you're, when you're sort of up at the, the main card, you sort of don't want to get injured or anything and put their show in jeopardy. Um, so – he 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 um been approached me for a while. We finally made the the deal probably two months before that, and um yeah man, I, I've been watching their show and 
all I've seen is the footage and the photos and, and the stadium and and just the setup looks amazing, man. Like it, it the way it looks, I've, and I've only seen it through Facebook and that. Uh, it, it, I can't wait. Eh? It it looks like a, a world class stage and man, like literally. <clears throat> He's legit. Even the way he, he talked, he, he wants people at certain levels. When he did that podcast, um, I listened to that intently. And, and mate, he just – when a promoter comes to me and talks to me, he, he doesn't seem to have a lot of um, rubbish. He, he's pretty straightforward and he's honest. And, and um, I, I'm really stoked to be on that show. And he, he's – from what from what he's been doing so far, he's real accommodating. And, and man, I just – I can't wait to get down there and, and, and experience it pretty much. Yeah, mate, I'm, I feel the exact same way. So uh, we're looking forward to it, both of us. I'm going to take you all the way back to your pro debut, all the way back when you're 0-0 and you lose that fight. You actually lost your, your pro debut and you lost it via rear naked choke. So what I want to ask you, though, is if you go ahead and you lose that fight via KO, do you become a KO specialist? Because, you know, most 0-0 guys go away after their first loss and however they got beaten... They work on it intently, you know, and they go hardcore in that. And as we know, you've got about 4,000 re-naked chokes on your record. Is that what happened or what sort of, you know, pushed you off in the direction of the game that you've got now? Um, I think being the sport, the, the thing that drew me to it was, was the grappling. I come from rugby league, basketball, union sort of stuff, and the grappling just always sort of felt natural to me. Um, in saying that... <clears throat> When it, when I when I had, did get that loss, I was really really devastated, man. I, I was I was annoyed at myself. Um, there's so many things I fixed uh, straight after that fight. I knew that uh, I was doing wrong, and it was a great eye opener. Um, in saying getting better and grappling, man. Like I said, long after I, I finished an MMA career, I still want to be that guy, that old guy answering the master comps in grappling comps, wrestling comps, man. I went in my first absolute comp uh, beginning of this year. Uh, out of sixteen people, I made it to the playoffs for the third against black belts, and man, that was just that was that was that was adrenaline. That was fun, um, not as much as an MMA fight, but it was great fun. So, obviously, that loss probably did unintentionally spur on the the, the desire to to get a better to be a better grappler. Um, but yeah, man, I, I don't know. Just I feel like as soon as I touch someone that's in my world, and and for lack of better way to explain, I feel like time slows down. Uh, when I when it on the feet, yeah, it's, it's kind of it. I still feel comfortable, but it still feels quick. Whereas the second I, I I feel I can grip someone, I feel my world just slows. And I'm like, yep, I know what they're doing. I know where they're going. They're doing this muscle, so that's gonna happen. And this, and it just plays out in my head exactly what's going on. Whereas, like I said, for standing, they, they it's not as not as slow in my mind. So yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a big probably a big impact than I more than I than I realized. And I've been sort of looking in what you what you're going on what you were saying. I've been looking a little bit into this flow state stuff and all that sort of thing, and the and the subconscious and the conscious thing. Is is that something that maybe you sort of look into as well? Just the the repetitions of you on the ground just makes it feel like it's second nature. Well, one thing, um, I come from a small town of Harvey Bay, and so me and my mate used to grapple in our shed. Like we we had some coaches that showed us a way at the beginning, Michael Green and, and Tony Green, and. Um, then I eventually had to go down to integrate in Brizzy and, and Dan Higgins. I still train under him, but it was a lot of going away and learning and coming back and rehearsing and rehearsing. So one thing we did to sort of build our awareness, so to speak, was we used to um, grapple blindfolded. So if we had new people come in, because there was only me and my friend at the time, Chet, really doing it, and another big guy, Chris, we used to grapple bl- blindfolded or with our eyes shut. So you got that real feeling of, of what the person's doing. Um, obviously, you need someone watching because you tend to bang into things and move around. If you did, we didn't have big mat spaces, it was like in garages, um, which I still train out of my shed actually. Um, but yeah, it was really just a sense of awareness, being able to have that contact. And and like I said, when you grapple, as soon as you touch someone, it's being able that that extra sense, I suppose. So yeah, I, I'd say that sort of training we've we've just naturally done um, from the get go. Yeah, right. And and apart from your grappling, you know, if I, you're watching your style of fighting, the other thing that really comes out and sticks into my brain is like your pace and your cardio. And and I know I've been looking at your Twitter and I think it's every day you must have an app that updates how far you've run and you've been doing a bucket load of running, especially for this fight. And, and I know you've done triathlons and marathons like that in the past. Is that 
Is that something that, you know, you feel really helps your game? Um, on, on a number of levels, man. Like <clears throat> when I first started at the beginning, I had cardio and <laughs> my um, manager back at the stage, he said, the only reason you're winning is you're out cardio. And I took it as an insult back then. But you know what? In hindsight, he's right. If, if you've got cardio and you just keep pushing and pushing and you've got good defense, there's going to be gaps. There's going to be holes. So in my mind, I, now that I, I, am, I understand that and my skill levels like caught up to my cardio, I feel that the fitter I am, the clearer I can think in there when I'm tired or gassed or, or get rocked by a big shot. Because I know I can just lean on my cardio and I can just keep pushing the pace. So, yeah, for me, just jogging as well. I, I love – sometimes I'll go what some people consider fast, but for me a slow four and a half uh, to 5K an hour, a five-minute five K run. And that's me rehearsing my fights in my head, going through scenarios, techniques. And <clears throat> and because I work in an office the last three years, sometimes I just get out the door and run. Um, I'll find a public shower park near that i'll run come back have a shower under that get my suit bag on get back to work so man it does a lot of things running for me it's it's relaxing but at the same time it boosts my cardio so and different types of running today was stairs with um sand sprints so <laughs> that, that was something a bit different just because i parked near some stairs and, and there was sand dunes so it's wherever i feel like pulling up and on my lunch break i'll, I'll just start training and and I subscribe to the fact that if you've got massive cardio, you can recover from be- like shots better. I mean, it's it's plain to see everyone, you know, especially in the higher promotions that got cardio through the roof when they get rocked by a big shot, they send to you know it doesn't affect them as much and they can spring back a lot better. Do you subscribe to that as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, except for a few fights ago, I got rocked in the in the jaw. That was that was a great kick, but <clears throat> in general, I, I can take some pretty big hits. Not that I want to. <laughs> No one should take that many hits in the head. Some of my fights have been a bit of a brawl. But, um, yeah, yeah, the, the fitter I am, I can sort of feel it sometimes when they're punching in that second and third round that they, the, the sting's not there, be it they're tired or, or that I'm feeling not as, as tired. So, yeah, I, I tend to agree. The better your cardio is, the better you can think, the better you can recover. And before we speak about the fight, you've fought a who's who of Australian and New Zealand lightweights. I mean, if you go through your record and you go through the names, you definitely haven't shied away from anyone. And and you see some of those names actually now making it up in the UFC. And that is that still something that you're sort of looking towards, or do you think that's you've flown the coup for that, or, or what? Do, what do you think's up there for you now, mate? I'd love to. I- Anyone doing this game would love to make the UFC. It's the pinnacle or one FC, those type of shows. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the in the in the mindset though that I think I'm past it with my age and stuff. And and like you said, I've I fought the who's who. Like pretty much, if someone says do you want to fight next week, I'm like, yeah, okay. And they're like, oh, but that could damage your record. Like he's he's pretty up there. And if you lose or or someone comes along, oh, he's only 20th and you're nine. Like, if you lose, you go out. I'm like, you know what? At the end of the day, I love doing the sport. So I just want to get in there and compete. And um, that's probably been detrimental. Like, even back when I did have a manager, I'd sort of nearly argue the point. No, I just want to go again. He goes, oh, we're just waiting for this contract. Or No, nah, let's just go. And I'd sort of just take fight after fight. So... Look, I don't regret any of it. I, I've enjoyed every moment of it, and I've got to see and, and experience a lot of places. Um, but, yeah, man, it's it's probably been the thing that's held me back from these guys and that I see it there. They're 7-0 and o or 9-0, and o, but then when you look at their record, they're four guys that you've never even heard of. Um, so I've, I've put my hand up every time to to take on anyone and, and just enjoy the sport and the roller coaster that comes with it. Mate, it's a great answer. Ethan Dunningham, here we go again. This is your second time round going with him. You obviously fought him on brace and you won that fight. Uh, you spoke about head kicks before and in that in that first round of that fight, you absolutely nailed him with a head kick early and you sort of dominated him, you know, for the first couple of rounds. But then in round three, he had a, a quite a bit of success up on the feet. Did you Have you gone back? How, how many times have you watched the fight, you know, for this um, studying it? I actually only had this talk with my wife the other day and someone else. I said, I'll watch my fight two or three times. And if I've won, I'm like, yeah, that was great work. Then if I start to watch it again, I just start to pull things apart, pick it apart. And I, I start to hate the fights, even the ones I've won. So I tend not to go back and watch too much of my fights. Um, <laughs> 
But in saying that, I've watched a few of his and and try to pick up a little habits here or there um, and sort of see where I can impose my game. Um, I actually walked out of that fight after that and said to the, the ref P when I said, man, that, that kid, I didn't know he, he, he um, debuted at the same time but because he'd only had 10 fights. So I said, he's going to go pretty far. Like, he was just one tough – I couldn't put him away. Like – um, I think the the dominant I had was when he'd make a mistake, and I think it was that that in my my experience that sort of lack of make a mistake and, and re- regroup himself. So it gave me time to implement my game. I guarantee he's go- he's going to be much better than what he was, and already back then I was saying he's gonna he's going to be up there come a few years, and like it's a year and a half later, and. I think he's even ranked higher than me. So, so there you go. He's improved astronomically. And I think this fight is going to be totally different to the last one in the way he's going to be a different fighter. I'm I'm going to be a different fighter. But in my personal opinion, I, I still think it's going to play in my favor. Um, I think that experience that I have, like you said, um, I'm, I'm over 35 so now. I, I can stay calm with that cardio. Um, I still think he's still going to make some of the minor mistakes and that's what they'll be. They'll, they'll be minor and that's when I've got to pounce and go. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Um, yeah. Do you think your range is going to come into, you know, in the factor again, you're obviously a, a, a pretty lengthy lightweight, you know, when you could tell in that first fight, just how much range you had on Ethan. So do you think you're going to use that again? Is that going to play out the same way? Oh, definitely. I, Stupid not to use it. I think my reach is 190, but yet my height's 184. So it's like ridiculously longer than my body. Um, yeah, I, I think I even kicked over his head in, <laughs> in one of them, um, and he, he took me down from that. Um, but yeah, yeah, obviously my, my, my reach and my height is, is a great thing. Um, in saying that, like, a, like what happened before, if I, if I overcommit, it's it's a great opportunity. If I was his coach, I'd say, when he overcommits, shoot, shoot. Um, provided it's not a knee or a kick coming. Um, but, yeah, so I, I, I use that as especially as a starting point, um, just keeping them at bay at where I want, that distance I want. And um, like I said before, I use my cardio, grind them down, grind them down. And in the later rounds when there's stings out of them, that's when I, if I feel up to it, I, I sort of stand a bit. But um, predominantly lately, I've just I've just been sort of wanting to get in there and make a statement where I'll finish, guys. <clears throat> and I think that's a good thing to get onto now, not sort of, like I said, go through the experience of, oh, yeah, I'll see what the third round's like or this or that in the back of my head. This Now I'm just sort of like, no, I'll get in there, do what I need to do and finish it. And this will be, you know, you've already won a couple of regional titles and this is for a title as well. It's the inaugural DFC Lightweight Championship. You know, what's that mean to you, that sort of thing? Um, bigger than people think, man. Like when I win them, it, it's, it's awesome. Like a, I've won – four i think and this will be the fourth <laughs> i should say three <laughs> okay um but to sort of I, I come through a point after 2015 where i lost um my eternal one where i had a bit of a down patch and and i think i've said before where every second interview or second person was like oh well you've had a loss now and you're getting old you're gonna retire and it kind of i think it played on my head a bit and um yeah, I was, I was kind of like, oh, will I ever get back up there? And it, then I started setting goals and, like I said, I need to do this and this. And and to get back up to a point, and like I said, I've been talking to Craig and he said, well, he likes guys in that top 10 doing this on a winning, winning role. And so for me to get back to where I was a few years ago, it, it reassures in me that I'm still up there and sort of it sort of puts those people sort of like, yeah, he's, he's still around. <laughs> And, and, and I look at topology rankings and, and one of these days I swear I'm going to do something about it and actually we'll get rankings on Raman Chokol. That'll be great when we can actually get some people who watch the fights do the rankings. But uh, who do you see as the number one Australian lightweight going around not signed to a big promotion? Not signed? <clears throat> I, I'd have to say Callum Potter. Um, I would have said um, Isaac, but he's, he's been off injured. <clears throat> um, uh yeah, I'd have to say those two. That isn't in like a big promotion. Um, they they look they'll on a, on a roll, a, a tear through people, and and they're both two guys that that put their hands up like me and took on anyone. Which I think, if you want to be in that ranking, you've got to be prepared to fight anyone. And unfortunately, there's been rankings before where you see a guy, I don't know, two, three, maybe even one, and 
And you look at who he's for, and it's like no one's even heard of those guys, but yet he's on a nine fight win streak and all that. Whereas I see <clears throat> Hardman and um, Callum Potter as, as they're two guys that they've they've taken on the best, um, and they're starting to move over overseas fighters. I, if I was going to predict, I'd say it'd be one of those two, and everyone's talked about it that they probably are up there in the echelons that aren't signed right now. Um, in saying that, look, man, the way the MMA scene is moving in Australia right now with so many fight shows, it, it would be hard to determine who is number one, especially with so many guys not getting the opportunity to actually fight against each other. Um, and like most people know, we this we don't make a million dollars from this. So you've got to take in people work. They've got to make money. They can't take every fight that you can take in. So it's it's going to be hard to get those top guys to compete against each other. Um, I would love to say I'm still up there in the mix. Um, I, f- I feel I am, and like I said, I'd take on any of those ga- any of those guys if asked tomorrow. Um, but I-, I think they're sort of um, doing what they need to do right now. Isaac will come back; he'll make a big splash. So I-, I-, I can guarantee that. Um, but in the lightweight, I-, I sort of see probably over the next six months, it's going to do- there'll be a lot of changes. I reckon. Well, mate, I look forward to looking at these changes. I mean, I'm going to give a couple. Of, uh, I get a couple of predictions from you. There's only got a couple of questions left, mate. Two predictions. The first prediction that I want from you is how your fight's going to go down. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. come out filling each other out. Um, <clears throat> like you said, I, I use my range. That's that's no gimme. Um, and then I don't know if you watched the, the last two fights. My sons have asked me to do these tricky little things. I did like a Superman kick off the cage or punch or whatever, um, which is ridiculous. Like it's, but my sons are, are finally asked me to do stuff as they're playing the games. So like, okay, yeah, yeah. So they've asked me to do one thing now. I got it's probably not going to land, but I'll try that in the, in the first minute. We'll see how that goes. <clears throat> then, like I said, I'm going I'm to get up in his face, um, dirty boxing. Going to put him where I want him, take him down, grind him, grind him, and I'll, I'll get that submission. I, I guarantee there's, there's – I think he's the, he's still a stubborn guy, so it might push to the second. Um, look, look, who knows? It could push further, but I reckon that game plan is, is – it's what I've done the last three fights. Everyone's seen. Everyone knows. Um, he knows it's coming. Um, let, so that's my prediction. Yeah, the next prediction I want, mate, the 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 super fight that's just been announced, Conor Khabib. Who's your money on? You got to put your house on it. I don't care who you want to win. I want to know who you think's gonna win. It's funny you say that. I've had this conversation about three times in the last two days, and I've got a really weird opinion on this. I, I don't know if you're gonna like it, but I I actually like what Nate Diaz has done and said he's pulled out from the fight. I don't think, and I've prided myself on being respectful and a good person, no matter in the cage or not. I don't think Connor should have the right to fight amongst other people with what he's done. Um, this is my opinion. I believe he should have to do some sort of program that legitimately shows that he's made remorse from what he's done. Um, <clears throat> that's just my opinion. In saying that, the fight's going to go ahead. The UFC is a money. They're, they're a business. Um, it's For business, if you're a business person, it, it's a great money maker. It's going to make money. Um, so you put them together. Um, I'm, I'm going to put Khabib, and I, I'd say he's actually going to ground and pound him out in the first round. I, I reckon same thing. If Khabib gets gets his hands on anyone, they're gone. Um, I, I just don't think Connor's got the ground experience. He he doesn't delve that far anywhere, and we we saw what Nate Diaz did to him um, as soon as he took him down. Um, look, Connor's probably improved from his boxing, um, but in saying that, I, I just don't see Khabib. Um, Getting knocked out like the other guys do, um, I could be wrong, but the the guy tends to walk through some pretty heavy punches to get where he needs to get. And once he's got his hands on you, man, he just doesn't let he doesn't let up. So that if I had to predict, I'd say that. Mate, good prediction. I love it. I'm not giving you mine. I'm going to wait at least another <laughs> month and a half before I give everyone my prediction. But, mate, it's it's a one-player game when you're in the cage, outside of the cage. You need help. There's no way else that you can do this sport. Um, anyone that you want to thank, you know, sponsors, teammates, family, uh, floor's yours. Obviously, foremost, man, my wife. So, <laughs> understanding, like... I finish start. I start training in the morning. Then I go to work. Then I train at lunch. Then I come home. I teach classes. And then I train. So she doesn't see me most of the time, but she understands that's who I am. I'm addicted to the sport. <clears throat> um, 
Then pretty much my, my sponsor, Elite Strength and Conditioning, Mikey Reynolds. He does all my programming there. Great guys. Strong guys. Huge strong guys. Uh, the front room, vegan cafe, um, makes some awesome meals, man. I wasn't even vegan, um, but the meals they ate, they make are just unreal. I've um, been eating vegan the last week. Man, Look at I, love I, it. Didn't, I didn't even realize like I was like pretty much 100% vegan my last two fights. And then it was like, wait a minute, that's all I've been eating. And I didn't notice, the, honestly, just didn't know the difference. I, I probably had some bacon in between there for brekkies every now and then, but since they come on and sponsor me, man, they make my meals and they've just uh, – the food's awesome. They, they make burgers. They make waffles. They make everything, man. They even made a, a, a shake and named it after me, the front room warrior. So that was pretty cool. Um, I can't go past Dan Higgins Jiu-Jitsu, man. That that guy um, has all the time in the world for me every time I come down to his shed and just – he he just goes, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, but then he'll explain it and break it down, man. He, he's just – He's the man. Anyone that knows Australian um, grappling, Dan Higgins is, is the man. Um, next up would probably be um, uh, RJ Marketing, and um, he's he's a good mate of mine. He does marketing, and he's yeah, he he does all my little promo videos for for when the hex and for Diamondback. Uh, he did the Diamondback one, sends all the information. Just a great fella, and yeah, that's pretty much everyone that 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 helps and takes care. I mean, a lot of a lot of local business in this town do just unofficially. The Harvey Bay is a pretty supportive town, um, and then obviously a big shout out to Fighters Against Child Abuse. I love their work, man. So, mate, well, I love Adam Washburn, what he does and what he does for the kids, and just getting that out there. So, big shout out to Adam and Facker. So, uh, make sure you check out their Facebook page, mate. It all goes down next Friday, August seventeen, Diamond yeah. Fighting Championship six. You're the co-main event. You're taking on Ethan Dunningham. Greg the Tarantula ad story, mate. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. And, mate, I will see you down there at weigh-ins. Yeah, definitely, man. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait.